I didn't want to be a CEO. So I said no, Mari. <laughs> I said no. Why? From sales manager to CEO, meet Angela Cretu, the visionary CEO of Avon. She's here to show you how to forge a path on your own terms. I opened the door and I could feel it, like it was a testosterone wave, like pushing me back. All this inside job, it seemed to me they talked English, but it, it was like a different language. I don't belong. I realized quite late that I didn't have to behave like men in order for me to advance in my career. I would never walk like them. I would never talk about this. the company I love. So I took on the challenge and the rest of history. From area sales manager to the CEO of the company. So here I am after 25 years to tell you I have had a fascinating ride. So why did you leave? <laughs> what went wrong? Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. If you're a regular here, there's a very easy way to show your support and to help us grow. Download the Fountain app on your mobile, follow Anatomy of a Leader with Maria Vorostovsky, and just start listening. You can share your thoughts on this episode by sending a boost. It's like a payment with a message. And see what other listeners have to say or create clips that you could share with others. Getting started is super easy and you can top up your Fountain wallet with your bank card. Oh, and you can also earn rewards by listening to the Fountain app too. It's seriously a no brainer. Follow the link in the show notes or visit fountain.fm to find out more. Angela, thank you so much for coming on to Anatomy of a Leader. Such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me here. I'm really glad to be part of your initiative to inspire women. Thank and you. Hope our discussion will bring them the value they are looking for. I don't doubt it for a second. I mean, your story is incredible. And I was so pleased when you agreed to come onto the show because having a woman who has started from the very, very early beginning, spent 25, 26 years within one company to become its CEO is super inspiring. And I just want for our audience to really get to know you, get to know how you did it, the experiences that you went through, your lessons. And so I just feel very, very privileged that you have come onto the show. So thank you. Thank you. So 25 years at Avon, that's incredible. How did you do it? You know, when I, when I joined the company, first of all, uh, I was mesmerized, you know, by its sense of purpose. And I, I was coming, go I was already having some sales and marketing roles before. I joined maybe from the ba most basic role uh, in the company as an area sales manager at the seaside city in Romania. For a global company, Romania was very tiny in its full portfolio, was maybe 1%. So we didn't really matter in the whole scheme of things. Yet I felt from the very beginning that my opinion, my my contribution is valuable. So I was I was really engaged with everything that is going on. Yet when I would hear the stories of people who would be 10 years, 15 years, I would think, oh my God, being a very young professional at that time, I was thinking, oh my God, how? How would anyone stay at the same company for so many years? They are either complacent, yes, or this company doesn't know how to, you know, uh, keep bringing in fresh talent. Uh, I said, I would never, I would never be a dinosaur. I said to myself, yeah. <laughs> so here I am after 25 years to tell you I have had a fascinating ride. It's true that every three years I changed country, changed roles all under the same purpose, under the same company, at very different cultures, very different business models. So I never got bored. I always found a new opportunity to grow. And from area sales manager, from the grassroots to the CEO of the company, something I have never imagined. I would have the honor and privilege and responsibility, yes, to, to uh, you know, to, to support my community. So when you so started, this you didn't think about becoming a CEO. It wasn't on your mind at all. At all, no. How one could think of that? Um, no. Especially coming from Romania, you would imagine. At that at that time when I joined the company, um, I think my foreign travels were quite, I mean, seldom. I mean, I wouldn't understand a lot about the world. I was fresh out of the communist era where you would feel you have opportunities and equal chance, but no right to self-expression. 
So the idea of creating something, you know, with your own, you know, your own uh, values and knowledge and experience was was out of the ordinary in those years. Mm. Was there a point at which you thought, actually, you know what, I can run this company? This has never happened. Not even now, after I actually did run the company as a CEO for four years. I never had this moment. I actually can run this company. I've always been quite agnostic, not creating these kind of big statements. I would I would ask myself, what is it that they can do today? Why would they, why would my people choose me as their CEO if they could vote today? That's a sobering question I would have every day. So the question was there to keep me fit, to keep me with the appetite for learning, you know, to keep me out of my comfort zone completely. But to make the statement, I actually can run it. I've, I've never felt it. Do you think it's a, it's a female thing? I wouldn't, you know, I've, I've met very, I mean, uh, it, speaking about the self-confidence, yes, you would, you would call somebody who say, I can do these things. Mm-hmm. You would call that person self-confident. I've never been self-confident. Yet I have always had a high degree of self-trust. And I see a big difference in between the two. So self-confidence is when you go outside and really project that, uh, you know, very strong, powerful per- person who really owns their game. Yeah. I have always tried to position myself more as an enabler than owner of any game in this world. Acknowledging that, that I might not know anything, everything or anything. I, I might not feel its full you know, spectrum and the complexity of any given issue. So always try to enable connections, you know, uh, be a connector, bring in people around myself. So I'm not sure if it's a female thing. It could be because females really know how to bring that value of understanding in ecosystem interdependencies and that the story is never about oneself. Yeah, the story is about the tribe. Yes, because they have to raise kids, they have to multitask, yes, while men are very focused, they are very action oriented, it's exactly what we need as well. And then that's why I believe that this complementarity of the values between women and men, if properly balanced, are valuable to humanity. So I wouldn't go to the stereotype and say, oh, women would never make that statement. It's true, statistics would tell you that uh, if women see that they qualify only for four out of five uh, required skills for a job, they would say, I would rather not apply. Yeah, while men, if they had two out of five, they would say, I mean, that's my job, naturally. Mm-hmm. This is how we are wired. Um, but, I, but I wouldn't take it as a, as a disadvantage if we know how to use it as a complementary value. Yeah. How did you use it? So for me, hmm, beautiful question. I realized quite late that I didn't have to behave like men in order for me to advance in my career. I didn't have to talk like them. I didn't have to uh, walk like them. I didn't have to joke like them. I didn't have to spend late nights in the bar, you know, to get my agenda across. I didn't have to... Um, uh, be one of the guys, although I try to understand the language and I try to be uh, respected and as well respect on, on my side. But um, what what I, I used a lot was that bringing all the times in every discussion the sense that this is not about me and you, this is about a value we create together. So positioning myself together with my stakeholder in a way that we both look at a potential value instead of trying to uh, instead of trying to make it about my own agenda or what I want. And and I know it sounds like oh that kind of that could be uh, a humble positioning and that cannot get you across as a powerful person paradoxically it gave me the the the, the most I would say rewarding experience and creates an unbelievable, it's an unbelievable source of energy and power. Because when people understand that what they do, they don't serve you, but to 
it's a togetherness aspect where we create a value that is going to benefit both in a larger scale, yes, the people around ourselves, the in, the emotional engagement, which is critical, is not just the knowledge people at times forget. It's the, the things in business are not just transactional, just like in life. It, it involves lots of energy and emotions and prejudgments and, uh, you know, upbringing. So when people feel that they are part of something bigger, just because we create a value that is going to benefit everyone, they are much more prone to bring themselves into the game. So this is what worked for me a lot. At which yeah. point did you realize that? Or is it something that you've always carried with you? We had a point, I had a point, and I always, I think at this story I said it for the hundred times, so I apologize for all those who have heard it maybe from previous interviews, was I had a moment, but it was not like in American movies, like that was it, from the next day you would see me in a completely different body, but it was a defining one when I had my very first, very senior management role, and I was still 27, 28, so I was... Um, just a kind of a short, just to understand where I'm coming from. I, I lived and worked in many countries. So I started in Romania. Then I went and opened the new market, Serbia and Montenegro. Then I then I, I moved back to Romania, this time leading the country as a general manager. Then I lead 10 countries in Southeast Europe. Then I moved to US to lead the entire, as a strategic business model innovation for the entire portfolio of 100 plus markets around the globe, together with the CEO at that time. Then I moved to Russia to lead Eastern Europe, then to Turkey to lead Middle East and Africa, and, and then back to Central Eastern Europe and then CEO. So it's, it's a quite a journey in all, all these uh, um, roles. The very first, when I led uh, Serbian Montenegro as a country manager, I went to the very first EMEA, Eastern uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa management meeting. And, and and at that time, I would imagine I was very nervous. I opened the door and I could feel it, like it was a testosterone wave, like pushing me back, like in cartoons, yes. I almost flipped on my back, exactly, <laughs> feeling it. Because you could see them, they were so confident, speaking about confidence, uh, joking, having these um, bursts of laughter, um, all these inside jokes, like in between guys, between boys, yes. Um, all seemed so old to me. I mean, they were all about 45. Of course, I don't think the same right now, but at that time, they, they seemed like from a completely different generation in my life for me. The way they were dressed, the way they were, you know, their, 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 their posture. I'm also, as you can see, I'm not very tall, so they look so tall to me. So I'm coming into this room. It was like a, literally an old boys club. The cigar was missing, that was all. There are discussions, there is discussions, golf, you know, football, you name it, all of them. So mainly Brits and as well, um, uh, Americans. This is how the management structure was at that time, as yes, the mix. What did you feel so, at that time when you walk through that door and a wave of testosterone hits you? Like, what what are you thinking? What are you feeling at that I point? I mean, I took, I was quite intimidated. So I, I still had that a little bit of ego who pushed me forward. Like, I, at least I'm going to look like I belong. So I opened my notebook and I, I, I kind of pretend I'm into the game, like like taking notes and listening to everyone. But in reality, I still have those pages with me. I mean, I would keep them as my own kind of uh, archive of, of, of funny notes. I had eight pages, but the only, um, were, only thing that you could really understand from those pages is WTF, because I said it multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> because I couldn't, I couldn't connect at all. I couldn't connect that. It, it seemed to me, they talked English, but it, it was like a different language. It was a very overwhelming, intimidating for me. So I called that very first evening. It was a three days meeting, but the very first evening I called um, my my coach and mentor. And I told him, look, Sudanshu, this was his name. Um, they got it wrong. If they wanted to have circus by bringing a peacock into a penguin's room, they got it. <laughs> I'm the peacock. Yet I cannot, I can never dress the penguin suit. It's not me. I went back in sales. Um, I'm not a general manager material. I don't belong. I would never work like them. I would never, I would never talk like them. So then he said, what are your biggest barriers? List them right now. 
And I said, first, I'm Eastern European. I'm from Romania. I'm coming from an emerging markets. They are all coming from a very different educational background uh, from developed markets. They see very differently the things, the rigidity of the processes, you know, and the, the, the view of the world is very different. Uh, so being Romanian, I don't feel I fit this culture, Western culture. Second, uh, I'm very young. I'm 27. They are all 45 plus. God knows how old they are. <laughs> We don't even speak the same language. And third, I'm, I'm, I'm a woman. There, the only other woman there was, was the HR lady who would not participate in the business discussions. I was supposed to be part of the business discussions, yes. And, and then he said, oh my God, listen to yourself. You just called out your biggest three multipliers. You are not on the other side of the table. You are just right there to give them. That's why they brought you in. Do they realize or not? To to complement everything they bring to the game with your view as emergent market leader. Since we are a global company, your view as a younger generation speaking about the new strategies, digital, engaging yes, younger generation. And third, you know, being a woman, what a bless. You bring your view in. So don't see yourself as defending anything. These are your biggest multipliers. And as I said, don't imagine the next day, all of a sudden, you know, I came in and really knocked that door, <laughs> cutting through that testosterone. But it stayed with me. And to me, it was my defining moment. And I always now as mentor myself, I'm, I'm advising my mentees, always I'm looking for the key value proposition, giving values, differentiators that they can bring to the game and work with those to be the multipliers instead of trying to victimize themselves. Mm. Yes. You gave me goosebumps saying <laughs> this, honestly, because so often, especially as women, we look at ourselves and we just focus on our differences that somehow we have to change them, adapt them to the status quo. And it's the opposite. It's that different perspective that adds an edge to Absolutely. you because you see something that the status quo doesn't see. And instead of how can I be more like them, it's more about what makes me special and unique and how do I bring that to the table and how do I make that my superpower and lead with that advantage. Yes. And we use that to enable other different perspectives. Because at the end, it's not just about you making the entrance with your different views. It's how you ensure that diversity, understanding that diversity is a divine gift, really divine gift, and living in so many cultures. I have so many funny stories, painful learnings, some, some more blissful learnings of what is it, you know, to operate and, and genuinely, authentically connect with people who are very different than, your, than yourself and how to find the value in that, how to not just embrace or tolerate how they call it is diversity, but but search it and, and, and read it and, and generate energy from it. Like it's the all energy that is needed. Yeah. How did you apply that in, in the business? So talking about, you know, valuing diversity and seeking it out and including that and making it part of the conversation. So when I, I mean, a different, different roles I've had uh, leading regions up to the CEO level, I always looked for relevant leadership, never called myself or my uh, first leadership team as executives, always call it ourselves enabling leadership team. I know it has the same acronym at the end, it's ELD or, but it's never an executive committee, it's never at the board, it's never called, you know, like, hey, I'm somewhere on the top of the hill. Yeah. We are enablers, we are connectors, we are multipliers. That's our role. And it's a response, it's a, it's a privilege because you get to be a, a, a multiplier of energy, of information, of resources. Yes, uh, uh, everything that your key stakeholders want from you is not just shareholders, it's community, it's associates, it's your customers. And, and to be able in this market dynamic, where you see it's not, pe people are not any longer buying services and products just based on price place promotion. 
they are looking at uh, gratifying experiences. They are looking at a social component. How by f being affiliated to this brand, I'm actually contributing to something bigger than just my transaction. Yes. Personalization to a level that goes beyond the CR. So, um, capabilities that human touch, yes, that people need. So for people to see that when I'm buying this product service, my name is Angela. I'm not just a woman at 50 year old. Yes. So when the market is moving like that, you need not just a team that has the right knowledge and experience, because if it's just that, you know, that would be obsolete by next year. But this appetite to explore, this vibrant curiosity, that agility, that humility never to take us granted what we've done till yesterday, nor the people around ourselves, never take us granted anything. So diversity comes with this gift because the more you bring a, a demographic diversity, like very young people, senior people, uh, different perspectives, different upbringing, different nationalities, different culture. My entire, every ELT I had, had a very diverse upbringing. Uh, the ELT I'm, I'm leaving behind right now, maybe is the most diverse ELT out there, you know, with, with, with executives from South Africa, from Central Eastern Europe, from Middle East. I mean, really bringing in that, that sense of, um, how can I say, independent opinions that at the end bring the, the full value we are all uh, looking to explore. Mm. You earlier mentioned that you had a coach, a mentor. At what age did you get a mentor? And was it your, was it you being proactive or someone kind of took you under their wing? Both, I mean, even from the very young age, I would, I would look for people you know, I would look to connect. And I was always very curious to see the inner motives uh, of people around myself, to understand what drives them, what's their source of energy, uh, how they operate. Um, I mean, it has always been a trait in my personality. So proactively, I looked either from friends or from other people I've met to, to create those kinds of connections where outside of normal conversations, I would get a deeper understanding of where they come from. With Avon, I had the opportunity to have a coach for my very first role. And it has never stopped. And it's not just for me, it's for everyone in the company. It's only um, your willingness to learn opportunities out, are out there. So I've always had access to coach or a mentor. It's difference between the two. Or, or I would shadow my, my peers whenever I needed as well. I had that opportunity. So it was a systemic one, but as well an openness for an, any kind of informal one. So I had internal and external coaches, I think my entire, my entire life. Hmm. I think it's so important to not only recognize the value of it, hmm. but A, to put yourself in a position where that is standard <laughs> so that's something that you know the business that you work for for example encourages but likewise to look for mentors and supporters and advisors in your own personal life and be proactive about that it does help because um look i have i have had very different styles i've had benefited from very different styles of coaching or, or mentoring but each of them have offered me a different life perspective. Yes, some of them I could easily adopt in the way I would operate in a market, in a situation. Um, others, I could never. They, they, they were never on my frequency. Mm -hmm. Yet intellectually, completed, it, completed my, my world perspective. And who would say no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to such, you know, reach offer mm -hmm. to wisdom. Yeah, yes. Talk me about two different experiences. The first one, your first promotion. Mm. So how that happened. And then to your promotion to the big job. Okay, so my first promotion. <laughs> this, this will um, be a little bit unusual. 
and I'm not sure it's it's going to give the the right advice to to very young people aspiring for a for a long term career. Um, so I was already leading as a division sales manager uh, in uh, Romania. So I was already I had a tiny promotion. So I was an area sales manager. Then I got a division. So because of the performance, uh, the country was still developing. It was easy to to really go up uh, in career based on performance. And then one of the days uh, we had at that time a general manager. He was Serb uh, and, and a very I would say a dominant personality, quite intimidating, and he would um, he called me. Uh, to the capital of the where the headquarter of Avon Romania was, and um, I thought, okay, he's calling me from some kind of performance reprimand, something. It was outside of our normal uh, management process, so I'm kind of getting myself ready with all the reports. I knew my area, my division was doing well. Still, you never know. So, um, and at that time, the, the the setup of these managerial offices was like in the 80s, like the GR office in a way. <laughs> so I had his assistant in front of the office, then getting in. So I'm I'm having my encounter with his assistant. He said, okay, Mr. Miuskovic, his name, you know, he's waiting for you. Uh, so I opened the door. I literally had the time only to have one step in. The other one was still out because he immediately raised his head up and he really I froze because he looked at me and he said, no, hello, no goodbye. I mean, so much about you, the sensitive, you know, right leadership of those days. No, <laughs> no way. Yes, exactly. So, and he said, you're going to Serbia. So I didn't understand. Was it a statement? Was it a question? Uh, was it for a training maybe? I knew we didn't have Serbia in, in our portfolio at that time. So I thought, okay, maybe it's a market. But I didn't even have time to think. But the way he said it, you would imagine. I mean, I, I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, thank you. You may go. Mm -hmm. So I closed the door. I'm turning to his assistant. And she says, congratulations. You are going to open Serbia in Montenegro. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what? I don't know the country. I don't know the language. It's so different. I mean, my husband, I have to call my husband. I mean, I haven't even talked to my husband. I didn't even know no, what no. I was signing uh, up for. Uh, exactly. I mean, to, to really move. I mean, I was freshly married. I mean, okay, three years already married at that time. I have 27 years today. So he's still by my side, despite of all these moves <laughs> around. And I called him like, honey, this happened. And he was the one who said, you know what? Because I was, I tried to build my courage to go back and knock to his door and say, hey, I misunderstood. Mm -hmm. I'm actually not going to move. Yes. Um, but my husband said, you know what? All this, you know, it's a sign. We should go. What's to, what's to lose? We should go. Let's explore. So he gave me that initial courage. And it was the best decision at the end. Actually, I wouldn't call it even a decision. Now I would tell people, don't say no, mm -hmm. make that conscious decision. So it was an accident in my case. Mm. Yet it was the best thing that has ever happened to me because from that success that I had in, in Serbia, I learned the language, I learned the culture, made friends for life. We became the best market entry in the history of the entire portfolio. And then Every three years, yes, I get another role moving to another country. I mean, I, I, I became somehow, I created a trademark in either opening markets, turning around markets, transforming business models. So somehow the company would want me every three years to go and, and, and uh, realign, realign the standards of the business. Uh, Did you create almost like a, a pattern in terms of not a pattern, but like a process of, you know, this is what you do when you arrive into a new country, a new role, a new challenge, and, you know, create almost like step by step, year one, well, first six months you do that, you know, 12 months, eight, you know, two years, three years. I, f I thought I would. I mean, my, um, I, I had my arrogant moments when after my first success, uh, when I went to my second country, I would feel I know the playbook 
So I was sent with a clear intent. I know how to do it. So I'm just immersing myself in my own, uh, with, with the framework of my own previous experiences. It has always failed me big time because, um, and I've learned it in the hard way because imagine at the end, as a new leader, you go in a new country, you would always be the foreigner unless you show the right humility and respect to the people and start from their position and not from yours, one thing. Second, um, the market conditions, the business models and, and uh, are so different that um, you might follow certain instincts, yes, or values. Those are not changing, but the rest all should be a continuous learning process and, and flexibility so you get the best results. When I moved from US, from New York to Russia in Moscow, even culturally, I mean, when I moved to New York, the CEO of that time, because I was leading the business model innovation, the strategy globally to digitalize, web enable the entire business model globally to work all my ex peers as a general manager to really transform their business models, that by itself quite a journey. So the CEO gave me her own personal coach to work with me to um, to act more into a New York kind of corporate culture way because I was working directly with the executive committee of the company at that time. And, and since some of our digital projects were supposed to be breakthrough, you needed, you know, the buy-in. And I was obviously way too potentially assertive Eastern European, you know, for their taste. So I had that coach and that coach would, would teach me how to smile even in my sleep, how to smile while I'm uh, writing an email, how to make sure that in every group setting, I do not leave that meeting until I'm making three rounds of asking everyone's opinion before I, we make together the call. So lots of new behaviors into the process. So culturally, I'm, 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 I'm fitting, um, the local frequency. Yes. I would call it frequency. Yes. So I can get my messages across. I can, we can create a value they want. So when I moved to Russia, to Moscow. Before we move on to that, yes. just want to touch on that. Is that something that you were open to receiving or was there any resistance? Because that's something that sure it's focusing on the other culture about what they find more receptive, but it's also that having to change yourself to, I guess, fit in a little bit. I will tell you a funny, very funny story with that one and, and uh, revealing in many ways. Let me finish this one and I'm jumping directly down to respond to your question. Moving into Moscow, the, after our very first meeting, one of the ladies really took mercy on me and she, you know, took me aside and she told me, hey, continue smiling like this and everyone will think you are an idiot. <laughs> And stop asking everyone's opinion. This will make you look so weak. You, they will appreciate if you ask their opinion in private. Of course, everyone wants to be part of decision-making process, but in a public audience, in a group, you don't smile without a clear reason. We don't smile even if when we are drunk <laughs> <laughs> and you come in and call out the shots. Now, moving to this, what does it mean with the resistance? I will never forget, I was working, I was living in Istanbul and I was living Middle East and Africa. So I was due to go to my very first market visit in Saudi Arabia. And I was already quite nervous and, pre -jud and judgmental um, around my how my new culture immersion is going to be, despite of my full curiosity, humility, elasticity to different cultures that I've developed till that moment, the fact that they asked my husband's um, approval to get the visa as a, as, as a married woman to go to see the country, that by itself in my Western uh, developed, shaped, uh, independent woman profile, was already creating bad feelings as yes, a bad vibe. So I brought, I went, bought an abaya, because I, you know, at those times, uh, women would not show their hair. It's only very recently that foreigners can 
in Saudi be without um, their head cover. And I bought a buy, I bought a, the burqa, everything. And and um, I knew that the rule is that once you descend the plane, you cannot descend without it. And I waited till the last second. It was only me and stewardess in the plane and Turkish Airlines plane that we would stay behind to dress up to finally uh, descend in Jeddah, yeah, uh, the city where I landed. Moreover, the local general manager, who was a British man, by the way, he couldn't travel with me in the same car. Mm-hmm. So there were few elements. Then I got to the hotel, and in the hotel they told me that the women-designated breakfast area, it's only there. And that in the lift, you know, if I see another man, I should not get in because it will, would make them feel very, very bad. So I wouldn't do that. And indeed, I observed that once I traveled to the elevator and the doors opened, a, a man wouldn't come in, yes, to descend with me till the, to the ground floor. So there were a few elements that really started me. And I said, okay, what is going on here? And then I'm starting meeting women in their own homes because in Saudi, this is the only place where you can meet women, you go into their homes. So I went from the very rich to not as rich, yes, and, and, me, and meeting them in their own environment, in their families. So in one of those gatherings, I'm coming in with my ethos and my speech of, hey, we are working as Avon with the royal family, together with other organizations, to um, uh, of, to, to um, get the women's right to drive. In the meantime, you know, that's a gain, a gain right. And, and one of them, again, told me, are you driving? And from her tone, I understood that I'm in a very wrong conversation there. I said, of course I'm driving. I'm driving my son to school. I, I can go meet my girlfriends. I can do that. I can do that. And he said, but why would you do that? Don't you have a man to do that for you? <laughs> Don't you have a protector? Mm-hmm. And then it started, you know, in a way it started, um, it was such a strong conversation, no matter my conviction and my values. I understood, hey, stop right here, Angela. You would, you know, you are, uh, how can I say, you are not offering yourself enough of opportunities to learn by coming in with these stereotypes and this thinking. So I immersed myself fully to a level that I wouldn't take my abaya off. So when I came back to Istanbul, I didn't take my abaya off in the play because I felt from the abaya a sense of protection. And it's difficult to explain. Mm-hmm. Of course, once I'm back in my, uh, my home and my own uh, uh, family values and everything else, it's a different thing. But I got a very high respect for how they see the world. And, and, and I call there, and I shouldn't, is there is no ascendum. But women everywhere, no matter their religion, their habits, their upbringing in the country, they all have the same hopes. The sense of humor. I, I, heard the, I heard the most hilarious, juicy jokes from my Saudi <laughs> girlfriends. Yes, they are as modern as we are. It's just that once they are outside of their homes, they, they, they do not have, they are more reserved towards strangers than we are. Mm-hmm. They actually put the makeup on and the best of their clothes uh, and their, uh, how can I say, sexiest, you know, um, behavior. With their, de- we, with their chosen ones, not outside. While for us, it's exactly the opposite at home. Mm. We are in our jumpers or I don't know, we take our makeup off, we feel comfortable, but when we get outside, we look the best of ourselves. So into this polarity, you find so many connectors, so many common values, the same fears, same hopes. Yeah, um, women everywhere. Um, are um, having really um, same dreams. Mm. Yeah. It's, I can't remember who said it. I think it was Gretchen Rubin talking about how we are so similar, but also so different at the same time, where you're talking about polarities, that hopes and dreams, what we want to do is so similar, what we worry about, what we dream about. But 
the external expression of it can be very, very different. And it's understanding that nuance of, you know, you're talking about driving a car. It's like, of course I do it. It's just normal. But the other perspective is like, well, why would you want to do it for it's yourself? Like, it's like I would tell them, like, like I would tell you, like, Maria, guess what? From tomorrow you can drive a tractor. Mm. And you would say, why on earth would I do I that? I can't yes, this <laughs> because I got myself a driving license and I don't know how many years, like 11 12 years ago living in London you don't get to really get yeah, more of an opportunity yeah. to, to drive but now it's a conscious decision <laughs> that you don't want to, to do it yeah not to drive I'm a very independent person you know have my own business make my own decision but there is just that one thing it's like why do I have to do that thing for myself as well why can't other people do that for me and this idea of independence is a really, really interesting one for me because yes, independence is great, but also being able to rely on other people is also great. And how do we move between those two seemingly opposite things? I think between this exactly is, is more of a freedom of choice of what's right for you as long as it is not harming others. To me is the equation of humanity and the secret to to uh, a sustainable future. How to create a world for everyone's needs, yet not harming the other one. And it's a sensible balance. And I think women can bring amazing value by the side of men with their holistic view and men are action oriented, really bringing this together as yin and yang to, to create that balance. So we avoid war, we avoid violence, we avoid all these extremes, yes, in, in human behavior that are destroying everything for our, for our kids and our future. Yeah. Talking about that, is that something that you think about when you're putting teams together about how women work with men and how to get the best of both worlds? Yes, very much. I mean, uh, with my people partner, we always think like, like in a puzzle, you get the perfect picture out of thousands of different pieces. Mm -hmm. None resembles the other. And, and they might look like they resemble, but in reality, everyone has its own place, completing the full picture. So we always will have more discussions and more reflection around how we complement everyone's skills than trying to make any of them fitting a mold. Yes, because this is, to me, was the key multiplier of the ELT as the, the enabling team mm -hmm. together is how we complement each other rather than, mm -hmm. you know, everyone being the perfect epitome of whatever, you know, leadership books call out want to be, because that would not be human, mm -hmm. that would not be real, that would not get out best out of them. We are all the sum of our... Um, uh, traits. Some of them can be perfect in one situation and, and full derailers in another. Um, you know, bringing your whole self to any kind of activity, business, one or in life, means the acceptance and the appreciation for the whole, not just for the very best ones. Mm -hmm. Yes. I went to an MBA for INSEAD kind of I guess it was more like a recruitment event. And there was this lady called Julie Meyer, who I remember she was speaking and I was completely overwhelmed and blown away by her presence and what she had to say. Um, I didn't end up doing an MBA, but it was a really interesting moment in time for me. And I remember clear as day, she was talking about how, I think it was her father said, focus on your strengths, don't focus on your weaknesses. Like you will never be as good as somebody who is excellent at the thing that you're not good at. But if you focus your energies on becoming even better at the things you do well, then that will be your, your superpower. Your edge. And what you're saying is that how do you, how do you spot what a person is good at rather than trying to mold them into something else? I mean, at the end, you know, we would have... I will give you a few practical terms and then we can talk a little bit more kind of a, like, like, like a concept, but practical terms, 
you would even have those 360s. Yes, in every big company out there, you would have this annual 360 where, where, where your key stakeholders, people to whom you report, you work with, or your own teams, they all give anonymously, of course, outside of your uplines, but uh, uh, feedback mm -hmm. uh, about the way you connect, the way you learn, the way you offer information to your support and enable others. So you do have that kind of report. I find those very meaningful. And those reports are actually telling at the end, um, you are a good basketball player. I always like this example, and I always use it with my people, especially those who got really overwhelmed by the findings of the reports. So like, you're a good basketball player or, or a good ballerina or a good... And, and I'm saying, look, if you are a good basketball player and, and people recognize you're a good basketball player, and, and why on earth, yes, would I judge you by your ability, you know, your own grace of not being you know, ever being a ballerina. Let's work on your basketball skills. You would, both are jumping maybe high, yet you cannot be both, really cannot be both. And, and let's stop that, that utopian search for perfection. Whenever I see perfect scores of the honey 60, I actually run away. I'm complete. Then I'm, 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 I must deal with a sociopath. Yes. <laughs> These are not human real beings. Mm -hmm. And then we get to exactly that. Like at least be aware of those derailers. If there is a sign that is harming others, it's something you want to keep under control. They will never become your strength. That behavior will never become your strength, but at least can be kept under control, not to harm others. That's all. Mm -hmm. And let's focus on those key difference makers, because this is what people recognize in you as value added. That's your source of energy. Nobody wants to work on their, their weaknesses. It's draining. It, one loses its sense of identity. It, uh, confidence, self-trust. I mean, you start doubting everything in your life by working on those weaknesses because they never give energy back because people will not never recognize those as strengths. Yeah, at best, they might not notice that it's a problem, <laughs> yeah? But then your entire energy get, gets wasted in, instead of being used on something that could make you really great. Mm. So we work, I never, I refused at all times, unless it was a real crisis with somebody in distress because of a certain derailer that really created a problem for others. I never discussed what worked on uh, weaknesses with my mentees or direct reports. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Did you have a process for yourself of figuring out what you're good at? I mean, you talked about the early story about like, these are your three multipliers. Talk me through your process of how you figure out what you're good at. Because throughout your, your journey, I mean, 25 years, you know, you're not the same person. Um, you know, you grow, you develop, and at each stage, you learn new things about yourself. So so you, you would have, of course, everything is evolving or by the opposite, you, 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 it gets a more kind of decreasing in value or decreasing of an impact. Because it's like, you imagine it's like a, like a music, I don't know how to call it, this music where you tune up and tune in different, different tones to get the perfect music. And we evolve with every decade of life, with every five years of life, with a new environment, with a new, with, with the new challenges in our lives. We, we evolve how we behave and how we connect with others. So I would split into categories. One is the, those that are more about the personality traits and they don't change a lot. Yeah. You, you would tune a little bit, but they are there. It's like curiosity cannot be learned. You either have it and it's stimulated, you can stimulate it, but it's there or not. Yes. The appetite to connect to uh, the warmth, the uh, energy inflow and outflow. Uh, I mean, these are things that are, are belong to everyone's DNA, a personality. Is, um, and I, I learned that those that have helped me most are my humility. Uh, my uh, curiosity and and the sense of freedom, not 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 um, being f f 
free to to make choices and and people around myself appreciated that because I've never been a pleaser. Yes, I position myself as a partner to my bosses and equally as a partner to the teams I worked with. Never above or below. Yes, at the end, we are all part of ecosystem. Mm -hmm. In the grand scheme of things, nobody is above or below. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's about the personality. And it helped me a lot, that partnership sense, that 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 sense of create, co-creating value that I talked about at the beginning of our conversation, that helped me a lot. And then in terms of functional knowledge, mm -hmm. yes, um, of course, with the experience, you bring new elements that you know you can offer to the team. You polish certain instincts. Uh, or at least you get to a framework of questions that are helping in managing business in different situations from utter crisis management to turnarounds, to transformations, to innovation, to, you know, acknowledge, uh, acknowledging and learning new, new areas of growth. So those are evolving at all, at all times, but without this fundamental understanding of one's identity, that, that keeps you through life, no matter the roles mm -hmm. one could have, and then gives you the, the direction and the compass uh, that keeps you being content to yourself and fully engaged in your presence, no matter uh, the activity you are engaged with. That's what to me is fundamental to, to one's um, sense of fulfillment and uh, happiness at the end. Is it something that you just went naturally like, well, I know this is how I am, or has anything helped you to figure it out? I mean, more as well in in so-called, I would say like uh, areas where I would need somebody else to compliment for. As an example, whenever I'm having a new start with a new team, I'm we're having this kind of discussion like in a safe space and I say, hey, these are my blind areas. I mean, in times of crisis, I tend to become laser focused and I lose my peripheric view. So I need to know who feels more naturally to have that full view to complement, yes, my, my skill, you know, in a way that we don't lose sight of things happening in our mm -hmm. environment or I tend to be impatient when things are, um, you know, with the, with the speed that we need. Um, I, I tend to be impatient and at times I might miss important either inputs or, or steps or periods of reflection. My people partner, you know, the my Briggs type, mm -hmm. I'm an ENTJ. J means I want things closed and, and by the sch is properly scheduled. And once I'm, I'm done, my mind can move on. Mm -hmm. My people partner, she's uh, perceiving. So at the end, so she likes to leave more time for reflection. And I was blessed with that combination. Yes, because she would come in and we found our secret words, if you wish. Yes, where she would say, let's sleep on it. And I literally, in my mind, I would even put to be able to, for my brain to process it because otherwise I'm still a J, yes. I would write in my calendar, I'm sleeping on it till Thursday because <laughs> otherwise my brain wouldn't accept the idea of something which I thought the decision was made mm -hmm. that I would steal. You know. But till Thursday, it happened many of the times that I changed my perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, or, or other times I found new reasons of why that decision was good yeah? uh, or get the new inputs or so. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that's the blend. I, I know these are my blind spots. I know some of them, um, and I gather them not because of my own self-reflection, it's because I always ask. And I don't ask, Maria, please, we have a one-to-one, -one, give me feedback, because that intimidates people at times, mm -hmm. uh, no matter uh, what roles we play. Yes, so feedback means that you tell me something what I've done wrong. Mm -hmm. So you cannot tell me yesterday, Angela, you were quite stupid. Yes, when I gave that answer, I've done that. Because I cannot change what I've done yesterday. I will feel so bad about it. And and uh, I'm not sure exactly what's the guidance for the future, how to stop being stupid, yeah? Uh, <laughs> so it's it's really not helping. Mm -hmm. I believe in the power of feed forward because feed forward opens up opportunities. So I'm asking you, Maria, what do you think I should do at our next meeting of the kind we had yesterday so I can have, uh, I can maximize my impact? Mm -hmm. And then you tell me, maybe you could try 
yes, to bring this kind of information or restructure your thoughts in this way or that way. And you know what? Then I'm all in. Because first of all, it's about future, which means it's not about who I am. It's about something which I can do if I choose to do. So I feel empowered in control. And it gives me energy because it's about increasing my impact. It's not me being bad at something. Mm -hmm. So I always ask my my uh, stakeholders when I have like, uh, what, what uh, you think I can do to enable you, to enable you and your success more going forward. And they can say, you know, I need more support in this kind of situation and that's kind of kind of support, mm-hmm. or I need that kind of access to that resource, to that information, to that person, or I need you to give me more space there or there. I think I can bring more value this way. Mm-hmm. And, and this opens up because it's also for people to call it out. So I'm gathering this kind of signals when people are asking me, I wish I had more time to make that call, I know how to translate it. I was too impatient. Mm. Yeah. But I don't feel bad about it. Yeah. I recognize it and I I, I rightly take notes in my... I love that. It's like feed forward, not feed back. back. Yes. You can't change your past. You will just ruminate potentially and yeah. feel bad about it. Yeah. Or what can you do going forward? that you have control over yes. because you don't have control over your past. And then we have that feeling of a, an alliance between me and you. Mm-hmm. It's not me criticizing you or you criticizing me. Mm-hmm. It's me and you co-creating something, mm-hmm. which which stands on, uh, you know, it's in our way to, you know, fulfill. Should do you want or not? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All of that is applicable to to all kinds of relationships. I mean, if, if, if one brings in a very simple way, uh, it's an effort. I'm look, I'm for, married for 27 years mm-hmm. and, and that's a it, whole other podcast. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> yes. Yeah. So, and I know my husband from the four, age of 14. Wow. So, um, and I can tell you even to today, he's my person. That's it. I mean, I don't even. As agnostic as I am, I don't question it to that level, that profound level. I mean, he's my person. He's that's it. Um, yet, our relationship requires constant energy investment, and that doesn't come as is, I'd never take him as granted, and that requires energy. Nor he takes me as granted. And and and, I don't know what life will bring us. I don't want to create statements. Yes, yet. I feel that in order for us to really uh, be happy ever after, yes, it's to constantly allow allow for uh, each of us evolving and, and needing different things with, with every new life chapter. I would love to go deeper with you about that. And I'm just conscious of <laughs> how much time we've got because I'd love to still dig deeper into your career history and I wonder if we should do a part two at some point <laughs> because I think that's so fascinating because in fact you know what let's let's go there a little bit because one thing that I consistently hear especially from female senior leaders is how important your partner is to your success and this is not about oh you know she made it because she had a rich husband or you know rich you know, father or family, it really boils down to the emotional security you have with your partner, as well as being able to, like your husband did for you, see each other's um, potential. So do you see each other's potential to push you forward and to provide you support when you need that? So. Talk me through a little bit about what you have, you know, about your partnership and how that impacted your, the world of work that you, that you do. Look, um, I do not believe women, professional women or high profile professional women can just lean in. I don't believe in bond women profiles where 
she would wake up be a perfect mom perfect wife you know she would make love uh, like like in the movies she would create <laughs> breakfast for all the kids and then say bye honey and then go to work be an executive you can see her like I mean, with a board you know showing uh, growing graphs yes uh, growing trends graphs and then uh, go to the gym and work hard you know and then without breaking her uh, sweat then she also makes another run and then she meets her girlfriends and because she's also very sociable and then she gets back home and once she's back home again kids get fed but then somehow she finds a way that she smells beautifully and she's going in her black silk lingerie to 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 sleep back with her husband you know talking their day everything looking like i don't believe in this kind of you know sort of this i mean <laughs> what <laughs> and there is so much pressure mm-hmm. so much pressure to be all those things in a single day mm-hmm. i'm not talking life cycles here i'm talking a day cycle mm-hmm. it's a huge pressure and god knows we have days you know we are completely exhausted being a parent, and I'm talking just being a mom, being a father, yeah. So being a parent is such it's it's a full time job. Yes, sure. not too much everything else that we need to do. Then and being a good co- I, I forgot the charity things, and yeah, because you also need to do charity in that day, yes, meeting community and doing all this. So I do not believe they can simply lean in and do it all. Um I I I I really believe in the ability and hopefully the the freedom of of choosing those activities and those relationships that that together give one the the sense of full engagement with their present not living in the past not in the future but right now and it's not it's not easy to to be content because one can plan a huge list. Like I only feel happy if you know, I'm in a um, beautiful big house with uh, two cars, with I don't know what, with a very rich, yes, uh, status or, and, and keep postponing that happiness or looking for partnerships and relationships that would meet that mold, that would fit that mold. And, and I have many people that I've met, and by the way, no matter the culture, that would be in this continuous search and unhappiness and utter unhappiness of not being able to find themselves in this search. Mm. So yeah. it's about to having <clears throat> too many, no, I don't want to say it, too many expectations. It's, it's, it's having to be, to be too demanding. To be too, too it's demanding. Too many things to aspire to. Yes. And what I'm learning as I'm getting older is that you have to pick. Yeah. You just have to choose. And that's it. And not feel guilty. And, and you, you you don't have to pick the same things every day. Because I'm a very organized person, it's my it's my trait it can be weakness at times to the desperation of my husband. I need to plan everything, to or or an advantage when I end my days with a sense of fulfillment. So it depends on how it's played. But when I'm planning my days, I I can I can choose what are my sources of energy. Where I spend my time, where am I adding value and I'm offering energy? And I'm trying not to go back to sleep in a deplete energy mode. I don't wait for my sleep to to um, cover what I've missed during the day. I'm trying to balance it already before my sleep. Sleep is a regeneration, um, healing time. It's not to cover what you've lost. Yeah, so I'm trying to fulfill the, that balance. Uh, sometimes I succeed. Sometimes I, I I do not. And and you're right. You you pick. But then your partner. And I think this is extremely important. And uh, and that's why I say I don't believe in bond women who can succeed as well by themselves. Yeah. I'm and I I found very few examples. I admire them deeply, and I hope it's working long term for them. For me, it wouldn't have worked. I mean, uh, at home I need that support. I need that partnership. I need that um, form of um, therapy in a way. Mm-hmm. It's one of my sources of energy, my my short or long walk in the evening with my husband that we do around our neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And that's our, our time, just two of us. No kid, 
know, uh, you know, when, when I'm finding my way and, and he f- invests the energy as well. So how often do you, know, you do that? Almost every evening. Wow. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. It's Why just our we... time. It's just our time. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's 20 minutes. Other times it's, I don't know, 45 an hour. Mm-hmm. But yeah. But just like walking, something I heard about going for a walk for a meeting, but even, you know, with your partner, especially when you have difficult things to talk about, walking is particularly great is because you're walking side by side and you're looking in the same direction. Oh, interesting. As opposed to looking at each other and it being you versus me, you're actually, it's a, it's a physical aspect of looking in the same direction that you are moving on the same path. This beautiful. I can't wait to tell him that tonight. So thank you for this. I I haven't seen it this way, but mm. I, I see I see how it makes sense. Mm. During COVID, when obviously you couldn't go anywhere, when our kids were really small, my husband and I would take these walks, and that's when we will kind of thrash things out. We haven't really done that since, but I'm gonna I'm gonna remember that because I think that's a really great tip. And then when we do, like for example, we had a date during the Christmas holidays and instead of taking the tube or a taxi we walked back home from Trafalgar Square and that was an like a great conversation and at the end of the walk we went to sleep and I had I just I didn't have that anxiety that I often get in the evening it was just truly it just felt very connected but also just really satisfied. And it was such a simple thing. It's a beautiful, it's so beautiful. I think maybe the most important thing that I think we've covered today, mm-hmm. um, people forget how to take little reset moments. Mm-hmm. They are all waiting for the one week big holiday of the year. And it ends up badly usually because you put so much expectation against that one week. And especially if we go with kids, you know, everything goes. Don't hey, get your way. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So you are much. coming back needing yeah. another holiday to rest yeah. from that holiday. But the little reset moments and never put the pressure to be too long or too strenuous. Or if, is it a gym or a walk or meditation or yoga? Or Make it small, but have it in because then brain doesn't find excuses. Oh, oh, you don't have time. You don't have time for this. You say, I'm going to put 10 minutes of yoga in. Ten minutes. Nobody can say I don't have ten minutes. Yes, you can say I don't have half an hour. I don't have an hour, but ten minutes for yourself can be there. Exactly what you called out is a walk. You don't have to have it every day. That was a long walk. Mm-hmm. It was a bigger reset moment. Mm-hmm. But can it be something smaller? Mm-hmm. You know, like just going. You know, for for uh, twenty minutes, yes, to walk it's or so do easy something to else. Just yeah. fall into a pattern. It's like, oh, yeah. I'm too busy. Just too busy. Oh, yeah. you know, and not put the importance on the things that really move the needle and those things. I mean, I tell you with my, the last four years have been maybe the most intense professional years of my life. We had lots of crises, our portfolio, we had a war with Russia, with Ukraine, that business wise, supply chain wise, ethical, ethical decisions have had to be made, you know, huge dilemma to, to be tackled. As well, you know, the brand rejuvenation at such, the, the, the entire transformation, very intense years. With that being said, people are generally looking at their key uh, stakeholders in the business. And in, in my case, the, the, the buck stopped with me. They're looking at me like you would look at the stewardess in a plane when there is a turbulent flight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She has a responsibility Yes, not to create additional anxiety. But that cannot come as an, how can I say necessarily as a, as a you have to feel that composure and that, com- that feeling of, you cannot fake it. Mm-hmm. You cannot fake you are in control. Yeah, you need to build up that sense of self-trust. Mm-hmm. And that can only come with this little reset moment, with a good sleep. I am obsessed obsessed to ensure I have a good sleep. How much sleep do you get? I do get, I don't know, seven to nine uh, mm-hmm. hours at times, mm-hmm. uh, for sure. I've, I've experimented. I, I have my Apple Watch 
Yeah. And I'm tracking my sleep. I don't know for how long now. It's ever since I got it. So it's been several years now. And I can tell you that if I've had bad sleep, I just cannot moderate my emotions. Yes. I'm snappy. I'm irritable. I you can't make sleep. decisions yeah. and I feel it. And then also when you go like a level deeper when I'm tracking what my deep sleep is, that makes sense. That's a true measure, by the way. And yes. the deep sleep comes with finding time for rest, relaxation, and connection. I think okay. that makes a big difference. When you feel connected, I mean, whether it's talking about, you know, your social circle to your partner, that you feel validated in the world, I that makes it basically it's all a, it it's all in a way sleep. energy yeah. and i'm not i'm not i don't mean energy in an esoteric sense i don't want to go there but very practical you know it's a fun because with the fundamental physics is it, it you know knowledge that we all have is the understanding that everything that we do you know at the end we are the human beings are you know energy charged organisms so everything that we do activities words thoughts they're all based on certain electrical Electric mm -hmm. impulses. So the more we balance ourselves, creating a and controlling this input and output of the energy, much of it sensory inflicted. By the way, it's speaking about the anxiety. We with 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 activities that will will um, give us that sense of relaxation. I think the better for the health, for the presence you build with the others, because mm -hmm. look at the leaders around the world, an anxious an anxious leader or professional, doesn't even matter at the end, or politician or who, whatever roles we play in a society, you can immediately feel a presence that it, um, you know, it feels good in, in, in her or his own skin. But like good, good in a sense, yes, exactly. You feel it, mm -hmm. and you automatically want to be part of that environment. It's 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 a it's a presence that helps, that supports. So I I would say in my professional journey and as well life journey, and of course I'm still learning, and learning happens through failures as well not just through all good stories. Of course, it's easy right now to call out, oh, I have that insight and that insight and that's it. I'm the 50. For sure, the 70, if we meet again, when I will turn 70, I will have maybe different insights or different, uh, you know, uh, dimensions in, in understanding the world and, and how it works. And I'm looking forward to discover it. Mm. Well, I really do hope we continue and definitely would want to hear your story, you know, at you know, in even not maybe in twenty years' time, but maybe <laughs> a part two. But um, yes, we. I've, I'd love to go back to the question I asked, which was, "What was your first experience of getting promoted?" And then, "What was your experience of being promoted to the CEO?" Talk me through that. So I never applied for the role of CEO because did uh, you apply for any promotion? No. Interesting. No, I I changed eleven roles mm -hmm. in these twenty five years. Um, never apply for a promotion. Yet I would always have that discussion, professional development discussion. It was part of our management process. And I would always talk about experiences I would like to have, never connected to a title. On one hand side is because in the initial, the early stages of my career is because I didn't know what I could aspire to, but I knew what I love to do. As an example, I would say, I would love to do more digital projects. That was uh, my, the, my recurrent themes. When I look at the, all the documents of my professional development discussions, they're all talking about digital. Later on, I would say, I would like to be in contact with different cultures, do these cross-nation cross you know, projects uh, in service model innovation, as an example, because I had new ideas or together with the team, we came out with a new concepts. Then I was passionate about working with Africa. And Africa as a whole is a huge, you know, content, very, very va diverse, yes, environment. And and so with every experience that I wanted, because we only discussed about experiences, it, it left a broader choice for my stakeholders to think where I could add most of the value next. If I would have chased for a title, 
people would have found reasons why I wouldn't fit that that, that role. I mean, this is at least it was from my experience. Uh, uh, so again, paradoxically, not wanting a title, it opened up more opportunities for me. But the CEO was not, I haven't applied for it because I wouldn't apply generally for roles. I didn't want to be a CEO. Mm -hmm. Moreover, when the, the Natura & Co acquisition happened um, and, and Avon became part of the group with the body shop, with Aesop, with Natura, we all became part of the group. They were looking obviously for a CEO. So they did a world tour and they met all the key executives. At that time I was leading Central Eastern Europe. So, uh, they've met me as well. We talked a little bit about the strategy. Uh, and there were three candidates for the role. They were assessed for almost three and a half months. And and we are all, of course, jokingly betting. It was an internal kind of bet house of who of the three. I had my favorite as well out of the three. So we were all betting of who is going to be out of those. Of I was not part of the Did three, you? no. So we are just about to hear it. We are all eager to find out who was chosen. And then I got this call from the founders and the board of the, uh, the uh, Natura and Co, which is the big group at that time. And and they said to me to go to Sao Paulo, to Brazil, to meet the founders and to meet the, the, the CEO uh, of the group. And um, and I thought, okay, maybe they need my skills to. They chose the CEO, so they want me to meet and, and support with onboarding because I was 20 years in the company. So of course I wanted to offer that support. And they told me, no, we actually, in our world tour, whenever somebody mentioned the project or mentioned the initiative, your name keep, kept coming up. Mm. So we want you to be the CEO, people trust you. Wow. And you cannot hide away, they said. You cannot hide away your career and, and achievements and failures and anything, the entire journey when you are so long in a company. So we more or less know everything about you through the stories of others. So we want you to be the CEO. So I said, no, Maria. <laughs> I said, no. Why? Because, um, hmm, good, good, uh, you know, uh, they were asking, this is what they were telling me as well. Because at that moment in time, I, I felt that it's time for Avon to go into a completely new chapter, which was an omni-channel. Yes, from being just a direct sellers to really open up to retail, to wholesale, to create a very different, an only access for our customers. And we knew we need a huge capital for this transformation to really um, invest back in a brand which was depleted of energy and support for so long and as well technology. So one, I was not sure uh, how the new uh, group would would um, um, allow, yes, outside of the acquisition, uh, uh, this kind of capital investment through the transformation. And, and second, uh, in my mind was, well, I would see that a, a, a good retailer could do that, somebody who knows retail. <clears throat> So that's why I didn't apply. That's why I said, no, I knew the hardship of the job is going to be big. So then in, uh, I went back home and they called me again. I said, look, uh, we heard your plan. We heard everything. I'm sure you will be able to, um, uh, really release this capital to the business model transformation. And, um, we, we actually, you will be having all our, your support, your agenda and your, your strategy is amazing. We'll have all your support. You have your support. So I said, okay, if there is support, if indeed, you know, um, this is the company I love. So I took on the challenge and the rest of history. Now Avon is an omni-channel. Yes, company. We uh, fully transformed its entire business model end-to-end releasing more than $200 million of capital mm -hmm. through fully, you know, transforming how we operate in key, key functions and key areas, uh, liquidating assets that are not productive, uh, investing back in technology, digital and, and, and brand and creating strong alliances as well. We, like in UK with super drug. And, um, now we are at the cusp of new frontiers for, for this, uh, beauty, uh, 
a brand that has a beautiful legacy is so much to transform to become a compelling choice for modern women. Mm -hmm. And this is where we are. That's an incredible story. You're like Jon Snow, which just does not want to take that <laughs> leadership role. There are a lot of cultural stories like Hunger Games, mm. Jon Snow, Harry Potter. The chosen one who does not want the role, but they're just doing the right thing. And it's interesting how some of the advice for, for women is, well, you know, you can't just do a job. You also need to kind of be known, talk about your successes. But actually, your story shows that by being and embodying and touching the lives of so many people within the business, that your work does speak for itself. Yes, and, and it's not just my work. Again, it's, it's how a leader, especially nowadays, where there is so much pressure from community to show value for, you know, for sustainability agenda, uh, shareholders who want their profit faster, higher, uh, associates who want a very different experience at work than just fulfilling tasks. Yes. Um, so when you act in this multi-stakeholder environments, that idea of myself as a leader and my work, it's it's not a sole contributor. It cannot work that way. It's a never individual journey. Yes. So it's it's all about alliances, engagement. You know, making it a movement mm -hmm. more than just a job. Create a sense of affiliation of the purpose of energy. Yes. Uh, that that really gets from people more than just their time and time and physical presence, virtual or not. Um, quantified in a number of hours a day. Yeah. So I think to me that that was the key thing that we needed as a team. And and, and luckily I, I've had the chance to work with extraordinary people, extraordinary people who got that par uh, paradigm shift mm -hmm. that this is not about just fulfilling tasks. We are all part of something bigger Let, let's create and the purpose is all helping because Avon is not just a company you know support women empowerment so it's, it, it does create as well you know that legacy and that purpose creates a very different feeling from now on when you join it mm -hmm. but in, this is how they engage in this transformation it was not an easy one because to to transform and, and release this 200 million dollar capital it also meant us firing people it meant reorganizing of uh, um, layers and layers of the organization structure. Uh, and and so it was not all bliss, you know, it comes with the pain and, and at times you feel stuck, other times, you know, you go too fast, you have to realign, uh, avoid bottleneck, uh, uh, synergize, um, work in, in partnership with the suppliers to make them strategic allies, you know, and, and skin in the game into this transformation. So. Again, see, it's it's never an individual story. Mm -hmm. It's it's always about repositioning ourselves, like you beautifully said, like walking. Instead of me talking to you, we are both walking, looking at the same in the same direction. So this is the kind of partnership I've created mm -hmm. with with my people, and I'm so proud of them. So why did you leave? <laughs> what went wrong? <laughs> nothing. Nothing went wrong. I actually. And this is a question I keep hearing everyone would imagine because this is how the stories are out there that an executive would leave a company when um, something is wrong. Nothing. Uh, quite the opposite. Very happy. We reach that moment when the company is now literally at the cusp of new frontiers. The results are already tangible. The progress has been visible. The people are very engaged. Uh, the board support has never been bigger. I came to the realization that exactly at this prime level that m my team has reached, that is the moment for me to step aside. So for their own benefit for them to continue now with the energy, the next chapter. So my successor is coming with those retail digital skills, an outstanding professional and a great human being. He was for two years with us. I groomed him from the very first day to become my successor. 
And for me as well is value added because I'm for 25 years in the company. I traveled the world. I've seen so many cultures. I've done it from, you know, on every role in the company is uh, uh, where I had the right the skills for. And, and life is just one. I'm reaching 50 years old this year and I felt it's symbolic. It, it's a beautiful chapter that I have to end now in order for me to create an opportunity for other endeavor, uh, other learning, you know, new challenges, new avenues of growth, really. Mm. You talked earlier about creating a vacuum, which I just love that expression. Talk me about that. I mean, this is interesting. I mean, once I announced that my intent to uh, leave the company, of course, I had uh, several discussions with uh, private equity companies, ec executive searches, they'd, and 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 some of them were very keen to immediately get me into the next obvious role, another gig as a CEO. Mm -hmm. And I had though this advice again from one of my coaches who said, "No, you." have to and and I know this is against the instinct and, and against the, the the momentum that I have created over the years of always living you know in a, a high rush um even well scheduled but very intense uh, management calendars it's a no you need to step out to to a level that the vacuum gets to be created when no predefined path is at sight because that by itself will put you back in, uh, in, 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 in the seat of you being fully yourself with no dependencies to any status, yes, any fear, any promise of whatsoever, and research, you know, once again, where that could the next value creation opportunity might come from. Either you fully offer it, or an exchange, or you get. I mean, it, and I'm so much looking forward to a level that I'm so excited by it that that I really think that this period is going to open up so many other opportunities that go outside of the obvious beauty industry, CEO role, or um, I don't know, a, a social selling digital digital company to be run. Yeah, this idea of being bored. And allowing yourself to be in a place which might even feel uncomfortable for you because we're so busy, you know, seven o'clock, you wake up, have your breakfast, read your newspaper, commute to where you're going. Then you have your meetings, everything's scheduled. And it's very easy to get into that pattern. And when you take the time off to try to do the same thing with maybe even your personal life, rather than allowing a different pace to take its toll. And I think there is beauty in accepting the polarities of accepting that this moment in time is very different to how you're used to being. And taking that moment to, as, as you said, to really reconnect with who you are without expectations from shareholders, expectations from colleagues, expectations from even customers and who you are. And I think to be able to take that moment is so valuable. Intent is there. I don't know how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. I've never lived a day without at least the awareness of a schedule and a, the, the, the mission and the, the power time and everything that have applied for the last almost 30 years. So I don't know how it's going to be. I'm going to tell you once I go through it, but the intent is there. I feel it. My, my instincts have never betrayed me. I know it's necessary. I'm really looking for it. It doesn't have to be long. I mean, I don't even remember a holiday without few either crisis calls or a little bit of catch up with what is going on. Uh, and I really plan to have that, that reconnection. Mm -hmm. And, and with that, uh, creating hopefully the openness for me to start exploring the, uh, my next professional roles, 
Do you or know would like my TBTs? I'm very um, not not really, not really, which is exciting because I don't have a predefined. I know what I love most. I mean, I really like. I'm I'm absolutely fascinated with how the business world, the playground, is changing. I love the new playground. I mean, you see companies going from mere cost casting to finally understanding that it's not just managing the PNL, it's really creating value multipliers. I mean, I love how they started to see the organizations, you know, from from human resources, how they call it management, to true people engagement as partners, I mean, and reorganizing themselves and the processes around creating communities of associates towards a goal instead of just organization structures. I mean, there is so much going on. You can see that the uh, awakeness is coming with the companies who are now understanding that there is a new world out there with the AI um, and and other key enablers that going, are going to change the game. So it's very exciting. I know I would love to be in the area of health or well-being because um, there is so much that humanity needs. The humanity craves for uh, a better balance mm-hmm. and as well areas of experience. Uh, and here I see a fascinating opportunity for companies to come together from different industries to create new products or new services. I see the hospitality sector as an example, redefining what would you feel when you go to a hotel outside of bed and breakfast. There, there is an, people are craving for escapism. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they, they they really look for new kind of immersive experience that are going to impact the way entertainment happens, mm-hmm. the way experiences, you know, created from brick and mortar in retail to digital to almost every area, how people will get to be engaged. So big companies out there understood and, and they are, they don't know yet how to tackle some of them, but they will only do it if they allow, if they create these alliances, either competitors together. I see new type of mergers, uh, big mergers in the future, to consolidations actually. And then I do see this kind of unusual alliances in between the industries that have never um, thought of creating something together. Mm-hmm. So they engage the customers in on, on with very different meetings. I see banking industries adding emotional component uh, into the experiences they offer to the financial services in in alliances with other type of you know uh, industry so um i'm i'm interested in these two areas one is either related to wealth and uh, well-being and and health or in this area of synergetic experiences mm-hmm. that that would create different uh, w- would really respond to this crave mm for personalization, gratification, um, for immersive experiences um, that people have. I certainly feel that it's, it feels like that's what customers, the world is, is craving, that connection to, well, first of all, I mean, from COVID, more of a focus on health. Maybe it's a little bit less than it was before, but it's it's definitely stayed with me. So something that, you know, that really makes you feel good from the inside and moving away from being satisfied with products Mm -hmm. and towards something that gives more of a, that feeling and an experience. I'm totally with you on that. What one piece of advice would you give somebody who wants to follow in your footsteps or somebody who, let's say an ambitious woman who may not know she wants to be a CEO, but maybe it's somewhere in the back of her mind. Like what advice would you give her? I would say not to, first of all, to find out her true identity that is not dependent on what her partner feels or says or what her parents told her that she should be or how to be, yes. But something that she feels that it's, mm, it's giving her that, that sense of uniqueness and power and strength, um, which is, um, 
I would say would be even the most powerful enablers in anything she wants to achieve in life. That no matter the life or situation, life or situ life situation that she goes through, she will know who she is. So she will always be the CEO of her purpose. You know, nobody can fire you from a role of CEO of your purpose. So whatever role society might uh, bring your way or life bring your way, one would know what compass to follow. So I would, I would start with that. Define what kind of experiences, what kind of um, uh, sources of energy would make me feel engaged. I wouldn't call happy. Many people understand happiness in a very different ways. It's not kind of lottery winning happiness or first day of falling in love happiness. It's not that hype, but it's that sense of me having the appetite, being engaged with what I'm doing. To me, that is the real sense of living life. It's full intensity. So once that is defined, universe, I deeply believe in that. People around yourself, every, I mean, every situation will come somehow to complete that puzzle. And, and, and maybe it's not that she would reach a CEO level, but would, would reach a role that would make her feel complete and, and happy. I mean, I was as happy being as zone manager, happier at times than being a CEO. If my dream was to become a CEO, <laughs> would that have been the solution to happiness? I don't know. Mm. Looking back now at your younger self, what advice, if any, would you give yourself? Stop conditioning your um, happiness, your, your engagement with everything on future events. Make it a choice now. That it took me a long time to get that there. I would always say, oh, one day when I will have that, when I will do this, when, when people will see me this way, when, when... I would behave that way. This is when I'm going to be happy. That was terrible, mm -hmm. really a terrible choice. Mm -hmm. So live in the present. That's effort, by the way. For sure. Huge energy. But once it becomes the status quo and how you uh, welcome life every morning, it's uh, very fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a choice. It's a conscious choice. Angela. Such a pleasure to talk to you. You're amazing. And I feel very privileged to have sat down with you and spoken with you and get to know you a bit. So um, really appreciate that. Thank you for the meaningful conversation. As I said earlier, you are one of the best interviewers I have ever talked with for your real interest, uh, your authentic way to connect and to engage. And I, I just wish that you continue to uh, create these uh, opportunities for all of us, yes, to listen to different life stories and then select what's useful for our own journeys. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks so much. Pleasure. Big pleasure. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast. I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.